everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending. My name is Faisal Hussein and I'm an Olin MBA alumnus. Prior to attending Olin, I graduated from the University of, University of Illinois, then served as an Air Force Intelligence Officer. After Olin, I joined Accenture here in DC where I currently live and work um, in, our, uh, in our federal management consulting practice. Uh, Wash U Olin meets you at the gateway of ideas, innovation, and inspiration with informative and timely speakers and events. I'm very happy to be here tonight for such an interesting topic. I promise to get to the presentation in just a few minutes. But first, please allow me to introduce two team members from Wash U Olin's graduate programs, Jessica Voss and Kelly Donnelly. They have come in from St. Louis to be here with us tonight. Jessica has a few remarks before we get started. Jessica. Awesome. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight. We're really excited. I know we're standing between you and a game six of a World Series happening tonight. So uh, 
Um, but we take you, you know, it starts at 8.07, so you've got plenty of time. We're, we're perfect on that. Um, but I'm really excited to, to share a little bit with you. Um, my name is Jessica Voss. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions. I work with our uh, full-time MBA program, our executive MBA program, our professional MBA program, and our suite of specialized masters. So I'm really excited to share some of the things that we're doing and tell you a little bit about that briefly. Um, first of all, one of the things we were really proud of this year with our full-time MBA program is that we reached 49% Female, uh, female representation in our full-time MBA class. That was a combined effort from our staff, our faculty, our student support, as well as our administration. So we we're really excited about that and pushing more women in business. Um, secondly, uh, yesterday we were just ranked the number one program for entrepreneurship by Inc. Magazine in partnership with Poets and Quants. Uh, so that was a really exciting ranking that came out of 27 business schools um, in both in the United States and globally. And it aligns perfectly with our values at WashU, where we want our MBA students to be entrepreneurial and innovative. So that was something we were really excited. Um, if you haven't heard about our full-time MBA program, this summer we took about 100 students globally on a global immersion for six weeks, so around the world in about 40 days, uh, where our students started on campus, where they really focused on you know, uh, values-based data data-driven decision-making uh, and got to know each other as teams before coming out here to DC for a week where they spent a week out here at the Brookings Institute uh, learning about that intersection of policy and politics and business specifically around Europe and Asia because then we took them across the pond where they spent two weeks in Barcelona uh, working with kava producers who were looking to expand their market but not necessarily their operations. So they were thrown into experimental, experimental opportunities. Uh, then and they traveled to Beijing for a few days of, you know, vacation, uh, some cultural uh, excitement. And then they went to Shanghai where they spent another two and a half weeks working on projects. Uh, one of the really cool things they got to do was visit a uh, rugby uh, jersey factory uh, with Judy Mu, who is a alum from our EMBA Shanghai program. And it was really cool because one of our students actually had played rugby on a national team from Zimbabwe, so he actually got to see where his jer jerseys were made. So that was actually a really cool experience for them. Uh, the whole point of this is that the they learned about values-based data-driven. They were put into very uncomfortable situations where they had to work under pressure and be ready uh, for what would come at them next, all while being uh, exposed to the um, global economy and understanding how that all works together on a global scale. Um, we have a lot of new and exciting things happening, and we want you, as you think you know, about the future and we look to the future, we are always looking to expand our opportunities to provide more flexibility. So pay attention to the newsletters we send, to the blog posts that we have about upcoming things. Uh, we are looking to expand our opportunities in our executive MBA space, as well as in our blended and online learning options to provide more flexibility. So if you have any questions about the things that are happening on campus or in graduate programs, uh, myself and Carrie are here and happy to answer those questions and uh, we will get started. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, just that's some exciting stuff. Um, you know, I graduated now eight years ago and the program has come a long way since then. I mean, the program back then was uh, engaging, it was flexible, it was a small program, and I think uh, the program has just evolved in so many interesting and, and cool ways. Uh, really exciting stuff. I think the only thing that could really be even close to exciting to that is uh, if the Nats win tonight. So <laughs> go red. <laughs> um, we'd also like to recognize another WashU Olin representative. Uh, we have here Ted Mannion from Olin, uh, Olin's Wesson Career Center's Office of Corporate Relations. If anyone is interested in meeting Olin students, please introduce yourself to Ted. And now, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Lamar Pierce is a professor of organization and strategy at WashU Olin. He's also the associate dean for the Olin's Brookings Partnership here in DC. Lamar's research focuses on economic and psychological factors that impact both productivity and misconduct, and the organizational solutions to jointly address these effects. He teaches strategic management in the MBA and executive MBA programs, as well as business, government, and society to executive MBA students and ethics to government executives at the Brookings Institution. Lamar's PhD is from Berkeley and he worked for a time at Boeing. Without further ado, let's all welcome Lamar Pierce. 
right, well, thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's always tough to follow such good introductions, so it's all downhill from here. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope you guys will be an easy crowd because I've got uh, two straight days of teaching ethics to GS-15s and SES uh, up here at Brookings uh, for the next couple days. And I don't know if you can imagine, but uh, they aren't particularly in a good mood during ethics classes, uh, particularly these days, uh, given all the constraints on what they're able to do and sort of what they have to address on a daily basis. So uh, these will probably be the only smiles I'll see all week. Um, and we all know that you know ethics is everybody's least favorite class as well because you know I think everyone's had different experiences on you know how ethics gets taught and you know the philosophy behind it all of which is very important. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I'm not a philosopher. I'm not an ethicist, uh, so I don't talk a lot about the fine line between what's ethical and what's not ethical. Uh, what I am is I'm an economist and I'm a professor of strategy. And what that means is I think a lot about ethics and misconduct from the standpoint of what does it mean to businesses, what does it mean to people's outcomes, and from a social standpoint, what does it mean for social welfare. Uh, so in some sense, it's a very practical approach to it, which doesn't mean it's the best approach, but that's the way I tend to approach it. Um, and when I teach, what I often teach about uh, from an ethics standpoint, I say, look, you know, I can't tell you exactly how you should feel about things, but what I can help you do is design policies for yourself and for others to get the outcomes that you would like to get. Because I think so much about ethics and, and about misconduct in general uh, is the fact that we're trying to get one thing, but we don't know how to get there. And in the same sense, if we think about productivity or employee performance, uh, we're trying to get one thing, but we also don't know how to get there. And what I tend to research and what I'm going to focus on today is the fact that these are really not separable issues. Uh, what I see, and I talk with lots of firms, do lots of research and consulting with firms, is I consistently see managers trying to solve a productivity problem or trying to solve an ethics problem, and then being shocked when it suddenly creates other problems they didn't anticipate. So they try to incentivize high performance. They're like, wow, I didn't expect people would break all those rules. <laughs> uh -huh. Or they try to say, oh, we need to crack down on bad conduct. And then they're like, wow, you know, everyone's unmotivated and, and nobody wants to work here anymore. Uh, I was listening on NPR the other day and, and listening, they were talking about uh, this issue in schools. So I do some work with private schools on trying to advise them on their sort of ethics policies. And you see the same thing happen with schools. You know, schools are heavily uh, incentivizing and put pressure on students to succeed, right? If you don't have a 3.95 in high school, your life's over. You know, I usually tell them, I'm like, look, you know, I went to the 72nd ranked undergraduate program in the country, liberal arts undergraduate program, so that doesn't even count all the big ones. And, you know, and I got a great education, life worked out. When you put this pressure on people to succeed and they feel like they have no ability to fail, they're going to do anything they can to succeed. And so that's why you get so much cheating. And so, you know, when we look at kids these days and high levels of cheating in the schools, uh, it's a problem to blame them in the same sense that if you're a manager and everybody's cheating or stealing or showing up late to work, that's your problem, not their problem. Um, that doesn't mean there's no personal responsibility, but if you see systematic problems, you've got to ask yourself, is this about the fact that 90% of all your employees are, are you know, bad apples or is it the fact that maybe you just don't know how to manage them? Um, but on the opposite side, if you look at this, you know, schools also are concerned about bad behavior, which is why they're implementing all these you know, incredibly intrusive surveillance systems. Uh, you know, they're, they're monitoring what, uh, what kids are doing on their computers. Uh, they have law enforcement who are basically using AI to, to back out you know, possible threats. Uh, one of the quotes today uh, on, on National Public Radio is they're talking about the fact that the principals are constantly getting like these emergency alerts because the AI system is picking up to kill a mockingbird whenever they have one of these assignments, right? It's the same type of idea. We try to impose these simplistic, very harsh solutions on one dimension and fail to see the spillovers on that. So I'm going to talk about that a bit, talk about some of my research and how we can think about trying to approach this. Uh, at the basis of this is, is my approach to strategy, which is the fact that you know, even if we think about large corporations, um, every single outcome that happens out of large corporations or out of society is a function of people making decisions. Everything comes out of people making decisions. Sometimes those decisions are complex. They involve you know, large coalitions of people making group decisions. But fundamentally, 
outcomes, whether firms, societies, small groups, are about people making decisions. And so if you're studying anything, whether it's productivity or ethics, any type of performance, you know, what we'd like to do is we'd like to get down to the root of that and say, what are the decisions that are causing this? At the base, we have persons or people who are making decisions, they're part of groups or teams, who are part of you know, organizations, they might be firms or governments, who are part of a broader society. And so regardless of whether or not we're trying to solve a problem at the societal level, the firm level, or the group or team level, we still need to fundamentally understand what are the policies that are driving people to make decisions that are leading to these sort of more macro outcomes. The problem is we do a bad job of planning for this. Um, so I talk a lot in my ethics class about the subprime mortgage crisis. And the reason I talk about the subprime mortgage crisis is because, I mean, first of all, it's the you know, worst economic crisis we've had in the US in, in our lifetime. But second of all, you know, people talk about the mortgage crisis as a macroeconomic event. You know, the subprime mortgage crisis and the financial crisis is all about people having bad incentives to do the wrong thing and about how all of their biases fuel that. You know, at the core of this is the fact that the home buyers had, you know, incentives to, to lie about sort of their creditworthiness, and the lenders had incentives to originate a bunch of bad mortgages, and the real estate agents had incentives to sort of smooth over the process, even if a house wasn't appraised at that level. Uh, pretty much everybody, you know, you have obviously the mortgage brokers uh, who get blamed for a lot of things. Um, but really, I mean, they aren't the worst of the whole situation. And the investment bankers, I mean, they aren't doing anything worse than anybody else. They just have more power. But really, this is a system of everybody doing the wrong thing because we set up a wrong system. Um, and so, you know, this is a really good e example of how a macroeconomic effect, which was meant to drive what we think of as the American dream, really comes down to a system where everybody's got the wrong incentives, and they all have a nice story that they can tell in their mind that allows them to justify it. So if I'm the mortgage broker, and suddenly, you know, I'm originating a loan for somebody that's a no-doc or a ninja loan, I have a story I can tell myself. And it's not going to be you know, that I'm intentionally trying to fool myself, but you know, I'm facilitating the American dream. I'm getting somebody into their first house. So we want to plan ahead on these policies because when people are in the heat of the moment, they tend to not make great decisions. The problem is we often focus our policies around productivity. How do we make ourselves more efficient? How do we perform better? How do we try to you know, sell more products? And the problem with this is when we do this, we lose focus on what the actual holistic outcomes are going to be of this. Uh, so one of my big um, uh, things to beat on is Volkswagen, uh, particularly since so many of my colleagues still drive Volkswagens or Audis. Uh, but you know, Volkswagen is a great example of this, right? Like, I mean, Volkswagen is not an example of a mistake a firm made. It's an example of a firm that had a very specific strategic position in low-priced, high-performance diesel, which is an oxymoron, uh, <laughs> what we've discovered here. And when they realized this was not technologically possible, they made a decision that they were going to take, take positions that are going to lead them to still make this a viable strategic position. Um, now, it's unclear what they actually talked about in the bad, uh, back rooms, but in some sense, they decided that there was a viable sort of business decision here to try to defraud the government. Now, what people don't really think about and don't understand is you take a case like Volkswagen. Um, we have very, very good estimates of the social costs of nitrous oxide. So we were like, oh, you know, we're skirting emissions rules. And I've done a lot of research on, on emissions testing, so most people skirt emissions rules. But, uh, you know, what's the big deal? Uh, so the latest estimates I've seen uh, from environmental economists are that uh, this decision that they made to basically uh, build software that would intentionally cheat the emissions test probably killed 4,000 people. And that's killed. So that doesn't include all the babies that had asthma and the old people who have heart trouble and everything. Uh, we have a really good estimate from a bunch of economic studies that this was effectively a decision where they chose to kill 4 million people. And you know, these folks knew it, right? But they get so focused on one dimension that they ignore the other. Uh, another good example, Wells Fargo. I get in trouble when I do this in St. Louis because Wells Fargo has such a big, uh, I usually have a couple of students in the audience who are kind of like this. Or, anyway, But you know, Wells Fargo is another good example, right? They had a specific productivity goal they wanted to reach, which is opening new accounts. They set up an impossible incentive system and also a control system. They required their employees to reach unrealistic goals. Much like the kids in a school, they set a policy that could only be reached 
uh, and could only be successful by cutting corners and breaking rules. Um, and so, you know, what's so interesting about this, of course, is then the CEO blamed all the workers and fired them. Uh, which again is, is the same type of thing, right? Like if you're a good CEO, if you're a good manager, maybe you should step back and say, what do I think is going to happen? Uh, and that's what I'll focus a lot on today. Uh, this happens across sectors. It happens in government. It happens in military. It happens in finance. It happens in all sorts of places. It happens in education. So I talked about sort of this pressure for testing. That pressure is not only on students. The pressure is on folks in the education world. So one of the big pushes in the last 20 years is, uh, has been to try to improve educational outcomes by creating high-powered incentives. Uh, that is, you know, we pay teachers for performance, we pay administrators for performance, or else we punish them for not reaching it and measuring as much as we can on test scores. Uh, so this is a graph of a, a major school district in the United States and the remarkable improvements from 2000 to 2008. I mean, look at this. They improved their reading scores from 47th percentile to 86th percentile. Um, Anybody who knows anything about the educational world knows that, you know, 90% of all the variance in educational outcomes are, are basically socioeconomic, um, which suggests like, man, these are great educators. Or maybe it suggests that they're all cheating, which in fact was what happened. This was Atlanta School District. And basically there were, you know, hundreds of administrators and teachers who were involved in this where they're basically all changing all the test scores. And again, like this is a policy that, that we should understand is going to happen. Um, if you put this type of pressure on people, you're going to get somebody who breaks the rules or you're going to get a number of people who break the rules and this is going to be the likely outcome. And so, you know, as opposed to this, you know, as opposed to putting up a policy like this and saying, oh, wow, I didn't believe that was going to happen, stepping back before the fact, designing a policy and saying, what are all the things that could go wrong? What do we realistically think is going to happen with real people when we implement a real policy? Uh, and that's you know a lot of what I'll talk about. And I'm going to leave uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, part of the other problem is, of course, the treatment can be worse than the disease. Oftentimes, we have these knee-jerk reactions. We see some terrible misconduct that shows up, and now we're like, now we're going to spy on everybody. So this is particularly a problem now that we have incredibly sophisticated surveillance systems. Uh, so we have digital surveillance systems, camera-based. So you know you have cameras in supermarkets that are basically looking at the checkout stand. And as an item goes by, uh, image recognition software identifies the item. It checks to see what got scanned and checks to see if those match up to understand whether or not the checker might be you know, uh, filching goods. Um, and so you have these things going all the time. Plus, in systems, you know, you have companies that are basically data mining all the emails of their employees. Um, the problem with these types of systems is often not that they aren't helpful in any way. It's the fact that if you give them to managers, managers don't know where to stop with them. Um, this is kind of the equivalent of, you know, after the uh, war in, well, I guess the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan never ended. Um, after the, sorry, that's not funny, it's just sad. Um, but, you know, after the big sort of ramp down when they really de-escalated uh, sort of the amount of equipment that was over there, the U.S. military gave a ton of military surplus equipment to local police. They thought this was a great idea. What do local police do if you give them lots of big, cool military equipment? They use it, right? They're going to use this. I mean, look, I mean, we all would use this. If you get a big armored carrier, you're going to drive it down the street and say, oh, you know, we've got a shoplift or we're going to go after it, right? But that's what they do, right? This is what people do, and managers do the same thing with surveillance. Um, if you give them surveillance and you don't have good policy designed to check what they use it for, then, you know, they're going to start saying, well, you know, I, I really got this to try to protect our intellectual property or to make sure nobody's looking at pornography at work, you know, which are kind of legitimate reasons for doing this. But I wonder if anybody's playing fantasy football or I wonder if anybody is searching job sites at my place. You know, and the big issue with this is as soon as you lose the trust of your employees, uh, then they're not going to trust you for anything again. And so this kind of escalates and people don't know where those boundaries should be. 
And what happens is we start designing these policies in kind of a whack-a-mole game. We design a policy to solve one problem and another problem pops up. We design another uh, policy to solve that problem and another one pops up. And so we need to think about holistically, you know, when we design a problem, how is that going to affect all the possible dimensions that we care about for the bottom line? And really this is about how do we design policy on two dimensions at the same time. More specifically, how do we think about sort of the productivity impacts, and I mean this very generally. So productivity can mean a lot of different things. And second of all, how do we think about this in reducing misconduct? Uh, and one of the things I'm going to want to emphasize for you is on most dimensions of misconduct, the optimal amount is probably not zero because it's going to be so costly to get to a level of zero uh, that uh, it's not going to be worth it. But not always. So the way I think about this is aligning. Like, I don't know if anybody here is from Boston, but you know, you experienced the big dig. You probably understand this cartoon. Um, but it's this idea, right, that, uh, that we need to think about how to align these things together rather than think of them separately. You know, let's not have a you know, chief of operations who's in charge of operations and then have a chief of ethics who you put in you know, some room in the basement and you know, they make everybody do a sexual harassment uh, thing online for, for five minutes every year. Um, so the way I like to think about this is I like to think about this that, you know, when we have policies, these policies have some effect on both dimensions. So I've just kind of arbitrarily put misconduct on the horizontal axis and productivity on the vertical. That's not a judgment on which is more important. Uh, but when we have a policy, you know, that has some effect on both. And what we constantly need to be thinking of, if we change a policy, what's it going to do to both dimensions? So there's some policies, uh, low-hanging fruit particularly, that we might think about. Uh, that could give us joint gains on both. I mean, these are great. Like, if you can find these, uh, and I'll show you some examples of these from my research, uh, these are things that reduce misconduct and improve productivity. Uh, you know, the, one of the obvious ones for these are anything that increases pro-social and intrinsic motivation in employees. Uh, anything that makes employees want to do better is, uh, is very successful at this. That's not as easy to do as, as many other policies, but this is partly why you don't want to make your employees hate you. Um, I was working with a retailer, a major re US retailer, uh, on their theft policies. Uh, and they were firing 10,000 people a year, retail workers. 10,000 people a year they were firing for theft. Now this is like stealing Snickers bars, basically. And, and, and their policy on this was, we're going to have former FBI agents who are really good at catching things. They're going to watch the cameras. They're going to catch people doing this. They're going to get them in a room. They're going to interrogate them. They're going to try to get them to admit to it, and then they're going to fire them. And I asked them, I'm like, OK, what happens after you fire these people? They're like, well, you know, we let the store managers hire to replace them. I said, what happens the next year? They're like, well, we fire another 10,000 people. I'm like, do you know what the number one reason why retail workers steal from the company? It's because they hate their boss. <laughs> they hate their boss, right? Now, obviously, low wages makes them hate their boss even more, uh, which is another issue. And I'll show an example of that. But exactly, I'm like, have you thought that maybe the problem is that the local manager is the issue? And you're going to keep hiring people, but the people aren't going to be the problem. It's the people who's hiring them. And they're like, oh, we hadn't thought about that before. Um, but this is the same type of thing. Like, they're so focused on how do we catch the misconduct and punish it rather than how do we prevent it. So these are great. Uh, these are bad, right? You think, like, who would be stupid enough to, to do something that kills productivity and also uh, you know, increases misconduct? Well, lots of firms. And I'll show you some examples of this. Uh, this is actually not as hard to do as you'd think. Um, <laughs> Usually this, again, also involves something that is incredibly demotivational for employees or something where they end up spending a lot of effort, like bad incentives that make them spend a lot of effort on things that are not actually helpful for the company, what we call agency problems, multitasking, gaming, uh, things like that. And I'll show you some examples. The harder things to deal with, and these are the things that you know, I think are, are trickier but important discussions to have that most people don't have, is how do we think about when it's worth sacrificing ethics for productivity gains? And this is not an easy question. Like, and I don't have like, the exact answer for any single situation. But simply asking this question, saying, what is the trade-off here, uh, is an important discussion to have. In the same sense, how do we think about sacrificing productivity uh, for ethics? And, and I'll show you how we might think about these. These are the harder ways to, to have this discussion. 
So the first thing I always tell people when I talk about this is you as an organization or you as a company or as a group, you need to upfront decide which are the topics, the types of misconduct, the ethical issues for which the optimal amount is zero. Which things do you have zero tolerance for? For example, sexual harassment. That, in my opinion, is a zero tolerance thing. Now, some of you may disagree. I think you're probably wrong. Uh, but this is something that, for me, like you cannot make a productivity justification for it. But like CBS, right? CBS clearly made this. They're like, yeah, you know, this person is sexually harassing everyone. Uh, but, you know, he's really good, and it's going to be costly for our firm to do this. And this doesn't go well, and the reason it doesn't go well is because your definition of where those bright lines are changes as you think about the consequences. So if you try to make the decision on where these bright lines are after they happen, you're going to not do a very good job at this because you're going to be like, oh, you know, we hadn't thought about whether or not we'd fire somebody for sexual harassment. But sexual harassment happened. How should we think about this? Well, you know, it's our star person. Um, maybe sexual harassment isn't such a bad thing or isn't a fireable offense. The thing is, if you define that up front, when it's not attached to any spe uh, specific person, you avoid ex post rationalization. Uh, so, you know, I, this is like uh, advice I gave to a private school when they were trying to figure out how to deal with parents who bring in lawyers when their kids get caught cheating. And, you know, this happens in private schools in St. Louis. Um, and I said, look, I said, after, so after your kid gets caught cheating, of course you're going to bring in a lawyer. Everybody has this natural instinct to protect their kids. But if you get them to sort of sign documents up front and agree to a policy up front, when it's not their kid, they're all going to believe it's somebody else's kid. They're going to think different about it. That is, ex ante before the fact, people can make reasonable decisions about policy. Ex post after the fact, they tend to rationalize this. Uh, another good example is the military, right? So I don't know if you guys heard about this case uh, with the Green Beret who um, basically beat the crap out of an Afghan police officer who was basically had a sex slave. And the, uh, the military covered this up. And they basically removed him uh, because they viewed this as a critical strategic issue to have a good relationship with the Afghan uh, police uh, force. They made this decision. And eventually, this got out. I think the guy filed a complaint. And it finally made it up to the uh, inspector general. And he was exonerated. Um, but again, like. Do you want your organization making these choices of, well, you know, this person's a child rapist, but this is a really important strategic uh, partnership for us? Again, you define that stuff up front because after the fact, you start really focusing on what the costs are rather than on what the moral principle is. Uh, I mentioned to somebody, we're going to talk about Boeing here. I used to work for Boeing, and laws changed, and I can't tell you exactly what happened, but Boeing Max, I think, is, is a nice example of this. Uh, as well. Um, if you lose fact of the site that as Boeing, your number one priority is not killing people in plane crashes, and you start focusing on the trade-off between the risk of killing someone in plane crashes and your sort of competitive advantage versus Airbus, um, then things start slipping very quickly. And, you know, and particularly in these low-risk events, which we, we psychologically don't do a good job of dealing with, you know, if you're basically making the decision of, do we think that this is a 1 in 100,000 chance or a 2 in 100,000 chance, uh, you know, that seems like a very small change uh, until you really think about what it means in terms of fatalities per year. It's actually a huge amount. Uh, we do a bad job of thinking about that. So, you know, one of the beauties of what Boeing used to be is the fact that, you know, their leaders were all engineers. And that didn't mean that they were super efficient as a business. But it did mean that the leadership was all obsessed with building the plane the right way, which again, isn't necessarily the right thing to do, but it certainly was a good way to stop sort of these types of issues from happening. Um, so I'll give you another example of this. So this is an issue on, uh, on wage gap and discrimination uh, by gender. So this is an ex uh, a big study that I did in China. So I'll try to explain this because it looks very complicated, but it's very cool. Um, so what we did is every dot on here represents a worker at a Chinese salon. So we had basically 900 workers in these Chinese salons. Uh, the pink ones are the women, the blue ones are the men. And what the horizontal axis is their estimated productivity. So these are the stars out here. 
The vertical axis is how much compensation they got in the end because what the company did is they let the teams of workers decide how to split the money. You're like, oh, well, this is weird. It's a beauty salon in China. Uh, this is exactly what happens in academia. This is what happens in Silicon Valley, you know, in software companies. You know, people work together in teams. They're like, oh, who gets to present this to the boss? Um, what happens, and perhaps not surprising to some of you, is that these store workers are all women, and they all make what the average man makes. Um, you know, and part of that is just because structurally women in China have less options. Not that that's different from here. Uh, but, you know, again, like you have to ask yourself as a business, suppose you can make the argument that you can have women pay less, get paid less, and they won't leave the job because of structural reasons. Are you okay with that? You know, do you think that there is actually a reasonable cost at which, you know, discrimination on gender or uh, sexual orientation or identity uh, or race is acceptable. And again, that's a value-based thing that you need to just, uh, discuss in your organization. Uh, but for me, like, you know, this is a non-starter. Um, There's just another sort of nice thing to give you a sense. This is the distribution of women's pay. This is the distribution of men's pay. Basically, you got to be a really bad man to make uh, what the average woman makes. Um, second point here. You know, beyond after you've identified sort of these bright lines, anticipate how these productivity initiatives that you're going to implement are going to motivate some of the classic bad behaviors that come out of this. So gaming, incentive gaming is a classic one. This is like, you know, you expect me to reach these goals by doing A, but I found some way to sort of skirt the rules and cheat to get there by point B. Um, shortcuts, cheating, these types of general things. Uh, again, I talked about the mortgage brokers, but you know what happened classically during you know the the boom in the in mid 2000s was that uh, the the sort of uh, sweatshop mortgage houses or I can't remember boiler rooms they called them. Uh, they would set incredibly high goals that people had to meet, or they get fired. And the only way they could do this was by basically falsifying information. Uh, so again, like understanding what is likely to happen. Uh, and do we care about it? Three, anticipate how an ethics initiatives might either motivate or demotivate employees, right? I mean, this is sort of the classic example uh, is this idea around sort of monitoring um, is, is a good one. So this is, you know, a good one. But also this idea around, you know, when you go in and you moralize or you make pe employees feel like you're just not treating a, a topic reasonably. So suppose you have a bunch of sexual harassment in your organization. You're like, we are committed to solving sexual harassment. Please take this 30-minute online training course, right? You're intending to perhaps improve uh, this issue, but really all it does is just piss people off and make them less motivated to work. So think about, again, what are those spillover effects going to be? Uh, and fourth, you got to ask yourself, what are the tolerable trade-offs? So, you know, this is Scylla and Charybdis from, from Greek mythology. But, you know, when you have no optimal solution, which is pretty much always, you know, when any solution is going to have some cost on one dimension, there are very few perfect solutions, how should you think about those trade-offs? Um, and, you know, one of the things that's nice in business is we often can you know, implement sort of financial trade-offs. We can try to put things in terms of the bottom line in dollars and do that trade-off. You know, try doing that up uh, on the Hill or if you're, you know, a government executive. You know, you can't really do that very well because, you know, you're trying to serve the public interest however you measure that. But how do you think about these trade-offs? Simply asking yourself, you know, if 5% of our employees are stealing from us, but to eliminate that, get it down to 1%, you know, it's going to cost us X amount of dollars. Is that worth it for us? Uh, simply asking that question, being willing to ask that question. Again, that's why it's important to define up front what are the things you don't want to ask those questions for. And then when you've defined things like, you know, employee, like I, look, I really believe the optimal amount of employee theft is not zero. Uh, and the reason that most firms are seeking to get it to zero is they moralize it and they take it personally when someone steals from them. Uh, but think about, you know, what is really, how much are you really willing to spend to reduce this? You know, and the question here is, you know, can you trade a little bit on one dimension for a lot on the other? So I showed these extreme cases, but one way to think about this is there are trade-offs. You know, these are bad trade-offs, right? These are trade-offs where you move a policy from here to here, and what you did is you got a little more productive and a lot less ethical. 
Here you tried to reduce you know, misconduct. You reduced it a little bit, but you got a lot less productive. That's a bad trade-off. What a good trade-off looks like is where you're able to increase one dimension by a lot and suffer a small cost from the other. And look, I mean, most of good management, most of good leadership is about being able to understand trade-offs. Uh, there's very, very little free lunch. Uh, there's some free lunch, but not much. My, my son's school actually has free lunch, that's nice. Uh, but uh, he still won't eat it though, anyway, whatever. Um, but it's this idea on trade-offs, so yeah. Unless for some reason he likes the beef nachos. I, I've, I don't know how beef nachos, but anyway. But, but these trade-offs, right? So some of these trade-offs are good. Uh, you know, but again, like for you and your organization deciding what is the acceptable ratio for this, um, that's something that's organization specific. And so like if I were working with an organization, I'd sit down and say, let me help you try to think through this, but ultimately you're gonna have to be the one that decides what the right level is. Uh, you know, look, my role usually when I advise firms is I can quickly identify for them things that are stupid, and, and a lot of them are doing these. And we can oftentimes narrow it down into a range of what are reasonable policies they might implement. But then ultimately a lot of that decision, you know, is some gut and some risk. And that's usually something that, you know, at that point someone like me is not the most qualified person to do. All right, let me give you a few quick examples from my research on, on how firms have gotten this right or gotten this wrong. Uh, this is just an example of the type of work I do. This is a $61 million field experiment I ran with a big auto company, uh, which was pretty fun. We saved them a billion dollars on this. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working with firms uh, trying to sort of implement a lot of these policies in practice. Okay, so here's an example of a policy that basically got joint gains on both of these. Uh, so this was a set of restaurants, so this is a thousand restaurants that we worked with, uh, that introduced a theft monitoring system. So basically, restaurant servers steal a lot from restaurants. Part of this is because they're underpaid uh, and their bosses are jerks. Uh, but they steal a lot from restaurants. And so one of the questions is, what happens if you put in some low-level monitoring? So this is the idea where, you know, if there's something suspicious going through the, uh, the touchscreen system, then it's going to simply flag it. And you're simply going to say to your employees, I don't think any of you are stealing, but, you know, corporate has sent us these uh, software, and so I just wanted to let you know of it. So what we found effectively was that, not surprisingly, this does reduce theft. But even more interestingly, it increases sales. And there are a couple reasons for this, because one, it turns out, a lot of the employees were pissed off that other employees were stealing. But second of all, and this is really important, um, if you can't make money from stealing, there's only one other way to make money here, which is by selling more and getting more tips. And so it redirected effort in the opposite direction. So you, know, you don't just simply want to ask how hard will people work, but where will they put that effort toward? Um, another example of this was, uh, a laundry company, industrial laundry company I worked with, they had a problem where uh, their employees were uh, you know, coming in late, a lot of them were uh, uh, doing lots of drugs. Um, they just had a bunch of just behavioral problems. And we sat down and, and did some analysis, and basically the conclusion we came with was like, you know, my recommendation to is, look, I think you need to raise your starting wages $3 an hour. And I think then you need to give all the other people who already were working for you wait, uh, raises of at least $3 an hour. And then you need to apologize for them for not giving them high wages before and give them a $2,000 bonus, which is cheap, which is why all the corporations gave these bonuses out after the tax cut, because bonuses are basically incredibly cheap, but they feel like a lot. And so what that did is it dramatically increased their applications, increased the quality of their employee pool, increased motivation. I still remember when they got all their employees together and had a group meeting to announce this, the employees were crying because they thought they were going to get laid off. They made this announcement and, you know, you can imagine what the impact. I mean, look, this is one reason why Costco is so successful, right? Uh, it's why um, In-N-Out is so successful. And I'm, I'm an In-N-Out, not a Shake Shack person, just so you know. <laughs> Uh, anyway, despite the fact that Shake Shack's founder is an alum. Anyway, but, uh, but same type of thing, right? Like this is something where if you can improve people's morale, you can get joint benefits. Uh, in the same sense, the same company did some other things that didn't work out. So this is an example. They set up an attendance award to try to get people to arrive on time. But when they set up the attendance award, what happened was 
It turns out that there were a bunch of people who were already coming on time before that. They got pissed off because they're like, I've always been coming for the last five years on time, and now you're rewarding these people who haven't been coming on time. So that demotivated them, that made them less productive. Plus all the employees started basically figuring out that if they came in six minutes late instead of seven, they'd still be counted as on time. They also discovered that they could call in sick if they were running late and not lose their eligibility. So again, this killed on both dimensions. Um, another example of this, I did work with a big department store in China um, with cosmetic salespeople. Uh, which is pretty fun. Cosmetic is, I think, the, the sixth largest consumer products uh, in China. Big, big dimension. And so, uh, but basically what they did is they had all these individual incentives for all the salespeople. The salespeople worked in teams. So what would happen is if two of us were working in a team and you were the star and I wasn't, you, rather than competing with all the other brands, would just simply steal all my customers. And so that hurt the team and sales productivity. It led to basically uh, cannibalization, a lot of these different ideas. Uh, another example, oh, okay, now I'm moving on. Uh, example here of a bad trade-off. Uh, so, you know, there a car company wanted to basically uh, try to reduce incentive gaming, so they weakened their incentive systems. Yeah, it reduced gaming a little bit, but it also dramatically reduced sales because guess what motivates salespeople? Um, incentives do. This is why I always get irritated by the gurus online who say, you know, incentives don't motivate people. I'm like, they don't motivate a lot of people, but salespeople, they motivate a lot. Like this, we know this works, like money, salespeople. Um, uh, another ex example of sort of a trade-off, but this is sort of the opposite direction, a good one. So another factory that I worked with, uh, they had a crazy uncle who had a surveillance camera he put up, and he, he took it very personally that workers were taking breaks or not working as hard. He put up a surveillance camera in one of their shops, and he had a phone there, and he would sit there and watch the camera and call them when he thought they weren't working hard enough. Um, I convinced them to basically remove this, and wow, suddenly the workers were more productive, right? because uh, they weren't constantly pissed off about getting uh, harassed and being surveilled. Um, a bad trade-off, so WAMU, uh, good example. Actually, my first bank account is six years old was WAMU. Um, but, uh, but WAMU, you know, they, they basically were vertically integrated between loan origination and securitization. The idea behind this was this would facilitate a better securitization because they'd know more about the loans. But the problem was, it did do that a little bit, but because they had such bad governance that basically everyone started ramming through bad loans. Uh, and so what happened was the bad loans, because of the systematic uh, uh, risk, basically outweighed the benefits of originating more of them. Um, another example, this is something called coal rolling. It's not actually relevant to the slide, but do you know what coal rolling is? This is when people with big trucks, they roll up next to Priuses, and they basically blast nasty exhaust. Uh, which is not cool, by the way. Um, although our vice dean does have a truck like this, although he doesn't, uh, doesn't coal roll. Um, but, but if you think about emissions testing, so Missouri privatized emissions testing. Rather than having the government do the emissions testing, they're like, it would be more efficient if we gave this to private industry to do, which in some ways is true. The problem is, and, and we have good evidence on this, when they did this, 50% of all the cars that should have failed started passing. Why? Because if you are a repair shop, the last thing you want to do is fail someone on emissions. And everyone's like, well, wouldn't you want them to fail so you can do the repairs? No, the last thing you want them to do is buy a new car. Because you know what? New cars, they don't break. Like, like new cars are great. Uh, what you really want is you want somebody who has that 1997 uh, Oldsmobile Bravado, which I used to have, and it broke a lot. Um, I had it for a surprisingly long amount of time. You really want that staying on the road because it's a guaranteed $2,000 of repairs. So half of all the vehicles failed after this privatization that should have failed were passed. Um, another example of a good trade-off, this is another study we did with a bunch of restaurants. Uh, we looked at pure effects and theft. Basically, if I'm a bad thief and you work with me, then what happens is uh, you start stealing and everybody else starts stealing. There's this normative effect on theft. Uh, it turns out that the thieves that are really good at stealing are also really good at selling because there's a common intelligence factor here. So if you're going to get rid of a high-powered uh, thief, you got to get rid of somebody who's probably a high salesperson. Um, 
But the problem is, you might make that trade off if you just thought it was about their theft. But if you realize that by having them there, they're teaching every new server who comes in, uh, then this suddenly becomes a very different calculus. Uh, and so what we can show is basically, if you have somebody who is an above average thief and you get rid of them, you actually reduce overall restaurant theft uh, by like two times as much. Uh, because they were having all these spillover effects on everybody else. So what do we want to do, and I'll wrap up here. So what I want you to do when you think about both ethics, ethics and productivity is think critically about it. Like put on your critical thinking caps. Um, for those of you who ever had Jackson Nickerson, you might you know, know about this. But, but the key thing here is before you do something, launch an inquiry. Think through what do I expect to happen. Um, don't say after the fact, oh crap, something happened, what should we do? Think before the fact, I'm implementing this policy. Let's actually brainstorm all the things that we think are really going to happen. Let's bring in lots of different people to come in and not be afraid to say, hey, you know, this is a great idea, but have you thought about this? Uh, so thinking about this and overcoming your biases and impediments. Second of all, anticipating the side effects and designing policies around how they're going to affect both of these dimensions. Third, plan for the people you have, not the ones you dream of. This is another huge mistake people make. They say, oh, you know, I'm going to design a policy around a bunch of people who always do the right thing and are super motivated. Um, great. Uh, this is like uh, firms that say, hey, this works in software. I'm going to try this in manufacturing. Uh, this is another sort of common fallacy. Um, think about who you really have as employees. And what you have is you have people. And people, when they're under stress or under pressure or exhausted, they make mistakes. And they make moral mistakes and ethical mistakes, and they make uh, production mistakes. Uh, but remember, like if you put a three-year-old in a room with cupcakes, you know, you may have trained your three-year-old really well, and they might last twice as long as somebody else's three-year-old, but they're not going to last very long. Eventually, everybody eats the cupcakes, and that's part of the problem with this, right? Uh, acknowledge that you know most of us are really like three-year-olds. Uh, including me. Uh, acknowledge that people are not purely rational. Don't design your models around a perfectly rational individual. People have biases, they have emotions, they're complex individuals. Uh, recognize that you know, humans care about few things more than fairness. And they have incredibly inaccurate views of what's fair because they all think they're in the top 5% of everything. Plan for those type of people. Um, don't plan for people who are going to say, the, you know, the optimal income for me is going to be this if I do that. Now, people act emotionally. They take things personally. They hate having stuff taken away from them. Plan for real people. Uh, plan for, you know, the bottom 10% of your workforce when you think about what might go wrong. And finally, last point I want to make here, you know, and I've said this before, um, accept that if you have problems on productivity or ethics, accept that this is your responsibility as a manager or a leader. Um, and again, it's really easy for people to blame those who work with them or under them. It's very easy to say, oh, you know, those rotten employees I have, I can't believe they're all slacking off or leaving early. Uh, usually that indicates that you're doing something wrong. And, you know, I, I bring up that retailer example with the theft. You know, if you have stores that where people are uh, stealing most of the time, it's probably a management issue. And, you know, I encourage everyone uh, to take responsibility on addressing those issues. Uh, with that, I am really happy to take questions. That's cool. Great. Yeah, I know you. I know you had a bunch of them preloaded. So. Well, thank you. I, I did, but you actually addressed uh, most of them, and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, you talked a little bit about sort of cultural issues at yeah, VW, yeah. and a little bit about cultural issues at Boeing. Um, what you've addressed mostly is making thoughtful policies yep. that address human beings. Can you talk a little bit about what you found or what you hope to find about the relationship between the culture of yeah. upper management and the behavior of middle and, and beginner management? Yeah, so, so it's a really good point. So culture is incredibly important. Uh, when I teach ethics classes, I talk some about culture. When I teach um, you know, compensation classes, I talk about culture. Uh, the main reason I don't focus on it initially is the fact that culture is incredibly hard to change. Um, it's incredibly hard to change. So firms that set out to change culture, they can do it. It takes a while. And usually you have to focus on one element of a first. What I like to focus on with culture is, one, acknowledging that 
trying to move people in directions that are counter to the organizational culture is going to be incredibly hard. And two, that the policies you set help define the culture. So one of the things I say, you know, when, on designing comp plans, right? If you design a compensation system and you reward one thing but not the other, and then try to tell people that you value the thing you don't compensate, they aren't going to believe it. So like, you know, this, this thing about like, why aren't my employees more cooperative and better at teams? Well, it's because you reward them for individual performance. Or you have a tournament structure where only one of them gets promoted. So the big thing I like to you know, suggest with that is, if you introduce these policies, what are you signaling to your employees? And in the long run, what will this do culturally? The other thing I like to emphasize on culture is so much of culture is who you have in the organization um, and who you attract. Because people tend to naturally sort into, you know, much like sorting into marriages, they tend to sort into the situations that they want or the cultures that they like. And so these tend to be self-reinforcing. If you're trying to make a dramatic cultural shift in an organization, and I've told a number of managers this, um, oftentimes you've got to let go 30 or 40 percent of your workforce. Because uh, the people who are going to build that culture are not probably in your organization. And it's very hard for us to change. You know, and one of the mistakes that a lot of managers make is the same mistake we all made sort of dating in our 20s, right? Which is we really think we can change people. And we think that, you know, we, we have the ability to change people from sort of the core of who they are. That's really hard to do. And people sort of overvalue their ability to change behavior and undervalue the importance of the selection process. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Yes, Aaron. So, so uh, if you would mind. okay. Uh, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is with you know um, uh, Volkswagen or, or other instances where the regulatory apparatus is such that you are incentivized as a company to do X. Yep. And some people claim that VW was incentivized by the European government or whatever they have over there to to have these diesel engines. But maybe it's not the best thing for society. So what do you do when you're constrained by a regulatory regime that perhaps is irrational or misguided? Yeah, so this is an important point, and, and you know, this is kind of a broader sort of corporate social responsibility. You know, I, the way I talk about this is uh, there, there are some problems that firms can solve, and there are some problems that firms can't solve and markets won't solve. So you know, like I'm a big believer that markets are you know, powerful forces for economic growth, but they do some things badly. Um, and one thing they do badly is account for like externalities, like pollution, uh, because they're not incentivized to account for them. And that's why we need government, right? There are certain problems that the government needs to step in and solve because firms will not solve them. And while we like, I mean, Robert Reich, who uh, was Clinton's labor secretary and is, you know, a super left wing, uh, is a professor at, at Berkeley right now, but super progressive, like, he's like, look, we should not be telling firms be socially responsible. Because when we do that, you know, they're going to spend a lot of effort trying to look socially responsible. And then we're going to feel like we've solved the problem. Like there are a lot of problems where you need government to step in and get the incentives right. So like I agree. Like, so what I love about what the US government did with Volkswagen, and I wish they could have done more of it, is they threw some of these folks in jail. And, and look, the biggest problem I see with the regulatory regime around misconduct in the US is the fact that you know, most executives are shielded from criminal liability. Uh, executives don't, you know, like, look, if you're, a, if you're a partner, well, I guess they don't really have partners anymore. But you know, if, you're, if you're a high level leader at Goldman Sachs, you know, look, maybe your company needs to pay a $400 million uh, you know, fine. You don't really care about that so much. Uh, but you do care about federal prison. Um, like, Leaders and managers and executives, they care a lot about federal prison. They don't care so much about losing four or five million dollars, um, you know, unless it's their entire likelihood. So, you know, another solution I've heard that's good for, uh, uh, but it's also a regulatory solution for like investment banking is if we put all the investment banks back into true partnerships, then they make a lot better decisions. So, Ed Jones, which is a St. Louis company, very well run company, you know, great strategic position. Uh, they're a partnership. They're a true partnership. And if you talk to the partners of that company, does anyone here work for Ed Jones? No. Okay. Like, they all recognize that if Ed Jones goes down, they're out of money. 
Like they don't have like their wealth is tied up in that, and that gets the incentives right. But in general, like I think there are a lot of things where the government has to play that role. Uh, now the problem is the government, of course, you know, as we see today uh, and have always seen, is subject to its own sort of personal incentives and the politicians. But yeah, I mean, I think regulation plays a really important role. Yes. Uh, that's a good segue to the question that I had. You said you're going to be speaking tomorrow, I think, there's today is to GS-15s and some of the government ethics are said there. Have, shall we say, been some uh, very high-profile uh, ethical issues within the government these days, both with the president and others or so. So talk to, so t t give us a preview. Tell us what you'll tell them, how to handle kind of the thorny situations within the government and what the, sure. and, and the old notion of doctor, he doctor heal thyself. So talk about what, the, what you think the government yeah, do. so part of the frustration of that class is I, I do not talk about the sitting president. And I've been teaching this class for you know, five or six years, you know, from back when President uh, Obama, although he didn't seem to have any scandals. Um, but I, I never talk about the sitting president. And, and I can't talk about the sitting president because many of the people in there, regardless of what they think, it puts them in a very difficult situation. Um, so I don't talk about it. Uh, what we... we not, not yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this much. If I can talk freely about it, and what they get so frustrated about is uh, the first George Bush president, um, George H. W. Bush, issued an executive order on the executive branch and like the 14 principles of ethics in executive service. Um, and we go through all of these and we talk about them. What they get frustrated of is, you know, I'll tell you this, you know, whether or not you think this is impeachable or not, the sitting president has violated them all very clearly and intentionally and has acknowledged that. So that's what's frustrating for them. It's very frustrating for them because, you know, the president isn't subject to an executive order because the president can set executive orders. That's what's frustrating for them. The biggest issues and one of the things that I emphasize is conflicts of interest. Like, you know, if there's one thing that particularly in government, but also in organizations you should do, is try to stamp out all conflicts of interest that you can. Because we all think that we can get around conflicts of interest. We all think that we can become independent and make the right choices. But conflicts of interest lead to bad outcomes. They always lead to bad outcomes on average. Um, and so one of the easiest things you can do is to try to eliminate, eliminate them. And in the federal service, like, those folks, uh, you know, their conflicts of interest are very limited because they get fired if, if there's actually a financial or a family-based or a romantic-based uh, conflict of interest. Um, but again, part of, the, part of the problem with, the, you know, the elected branch is this question of um, the president gets to set the rules. The president's elected by the people. Um, and so, you know, unless you believe something's impeachable, then the president can kind of do what they want. Unless the courts say they can't, but the courts seem to not be sort of stamping in that too much. Anyway, that's kind of how I would talk about it, but I can't really talk about it with them. We're going to take one more question. Okay. Oh, sorry. So my question is related to um, culture and ethics as yes. well. Okay. Um, and I, so I work for a government entity and, and in HR, and so we talk a lot about culture, and so the yeah. misconduct isn't necessarily as blatant as theft, per se. Yep. Oftentimes, it's seen um, in terms of EEO cases. Yep. Um, and so we talk a lot about um, unconscious bias, um, yep. inclusion, and, ch and how that relates to culture. And so you had mentioned about getting rid of 30% of the workforce, and in government, um, that's not always yeah, you, easy. That's right. Um, I mean, so my question to you is, how yeah. do you, um, what, what, what is your response for maybe a government entity trying to change culture um, for its government its, um, competitive civil service workforce? Yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, look, the first thing I always tell when I started these classes for the government execs, I'm like, look, I'm like, I got to tell you, you guys have the hardest job because there are a lot of problems you have that if you were in private industry, I would say, do this, this, and this. You know, change your comp plan, change your hiring policy, change your promotion policy, like restructure your organization. And they all just start laughing, right? Because they can't do that. And so, so much of what they have to do is about soft skills and what we truly call leadership, right? So there's a little bit of a difference between management and leadership. But so much of this is about leadership. And, and the hard thing about leadership is that, <clears throat> uh, there aren't real discrete solutions. But the things that I would say that, that I emphasize with them most importantly are um, 
you know, signal to people credibly what you value in the organization. Uh, so, you know, you can't give people financial incentives, but you can recognize and promote and reward and celebrate the people who are doing things the right way. Uh, two, find people who will champion the change. And one of the most powerful things uh, for that is find people who will champion the change for which the change is costly. So find somebody who, who can, you know, everybody knows like this change is not going to reward them. But they still believe in it and they will champion it. Uh, as a leader, uh, make sure that if there are sacrifices to be made that you take the biggest sacrifice. Um, I mean, these are, you know, communicate clearly what you, you know, these are kind of the, the basic things you can do. Now, there are others who are more expert at this that could probably tell you some ninja tricks and stuff. But those are the key things that I emphasize. Sorry, you have a follow up or? Um, no, I was going to say sometimes um, leadership is politically driven. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to get yeah. champions sometimes in that arena as well. So and I can ask you more offline. And that's why nobody wants to be in the senior executive services, right? So you, does everybody know how that sort of system works? You have SCS and GS. Well, part of the problem in this system, and I know you're going to cut me off, but part of the problem in this system is that once you read SES, then you start interacting with the political appointees. Um, the other problem with reaching SES is once you reach SES, you no longer get the regional salary adjustment based on cost of living. So for people in DC, going from GS15 to SES, I don't know what it is now, but I think oftentimes the salary decreases. Uh, it doesn't, okay, well it doesn't go up much. It, it goes up very little. Um, and, and, the, and the pain just you know, escalates, right? <laughs> so it's kind of like my mom was an elementary school principal for years, right? It's like being a principal. If you're a senior teacher, uh, you really got to want to be a principal to be a principal because the hourly pay is way lower. It's a brutal job. Nobody appreciates you. Well, few people do, uh, but most people don't. It's like being SES. So yeah, I mean, for SES, it's, it's even tougher, tougher, and it really depends just on who the political appointee is. Um, the ones that I've talked to, some of the SES twos that I've talked to, uh, you know, they've said, look, if you have a good appointee, then it's, you know, pretty easy. If you have a bad one, you try to sort of stay under the radar uh, so that you can, you know, lead the way you want to lead uh, and hope that they don't intervene too much. Anyway, that's not a great answer, but. <laughs> All right. So uh, are you going to wrap me up? Or? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, All right. Thanks so much, folks. Super insightful. I, uh, I wish you, your class was available when I was at Olin. I would have definitely taken it. And uh, uh, interesting questions from the audience. Um, before we go, I uh, wanted to let everyone know that if you're interested in Olin, uh, learning more about Olin, uh, or getting involved in some way, uh, you can reach out to Jessica, Carrie, or Ted. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation. Uh, we want to invite you to uh, the ballroom next door. Uh, we're going to have a reception, some uh, snacks and drinks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a wonderful evening. Yeah.